Hi everybody, this is Christian Basil with MarkWho42, and we just want to take the time to thank everybody who's contributed to our show to ensure that we continue to bring you the latest news, reviews, and interviews throughout the Hooniverse and beyond, like our friends at Audible.com. Right now, you can actually go there and get a free 30-day trial and a free download. Just simply go to audibletrial.com slash MarkWho42 and sign up, and that's all you have to do. And if you'd like to contribute directly to the show, go to www.markwho42.net and hit the donate button on the far right hand side. Contribute whatever you can give us so that we can bring you this show. Thank you again for everybody who contributes and thank you for listening. Hi guys, my name is Gigi Edgley and I'm the host of Jim Henson's Creature Shop Challenge and I play Chiana on Farscape and I'm so, so, so very happy to be here speaking to Mark Who 42. Welcome to Mark Who 42. That's right, Mark Who 42, the Doctor Who online radio show here on Krypton Radio. I'm your host, Mark Baumgarten, and with me today are... Patty Hawkins and Iggy Matthews. Hello. Hi, Iggy. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. You're going to be showing up on this show quite frequently in the next couple of weeks. It's like a bad acne breakout. Just as soon as you get rid of one, and here comes another one. And another <laughs> one. So this week's episode is all about the latest Doctor Who episode that was just on Saturday night called... What was it again, folks? The Girl Who Died. The Girl Who Died. But after our review, we will have a special interview with Gigi Edgley. Gigi Edgley is a featured player on Farscape, which was a show back in the, was it the 90s or the 2000s? I mean, how long ago was Farscape? Uh, it was a, it was a double lots. It was a late nineties, early double lots. Okay. And then it came back for a mini series. She's also doing some other work, including some great films that are being sponsored by Kickstarter and Indiegogo and things like that. We'll have that interview later, but first let's get into the girl who died. Oh my. All right. Well, Obviously, it starts off, in my opinion, a little bit goofy with the whole Vikings and just they arrive. And well, it's, well, it starts off with a cold opening. Yeah, like, yeah, the cold the opening. The... We have to mention the cold opening, Patty. Which I, which I, I actually like. I used to like it when the James Bond films would start off with a cold opening. It'd be like a, a separate mission that had nothing to do with the integral plot, uh, other than maybe a MacGuffin at the end. But um, I kind of like it when you drop head into it. Although, first of all, I'm getting tired of the cloisters being way overused. Uh, the cloisters are supposed to be for A-level heavy-duty threats. And right. second of all, the TARDIS console... All right, we've seen it spark and pop and and whistle uh, and Roman candle effect. We we it doesn't need to happen every single time. You know the TARDIS runs afoul of anything particular. Well, it was being shot at by an alien armada, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, but you know it's it's supposed to be invulnerable. Of course, you know again that's what Missy said. The doctor lied about that. So yeah. I, I you can take it or leave it. I guess my whole thing is that okay. It seems like every other episode, the TARDIS console has to have a shower of sparks, yeah. and I, I don't, I don't think that's necessary. I don't think it's necessary either. And to put even more of a bummer on this, Clara didn't die. Clara could have died hopes. in this opening. She could have died. I had died hopes with that opening. spider. Had she could have got sucked out in outer space. That would have solved a lot of our problems, wouldn't it? It would have solved a lot of our problems, but she didn't. She lived. Well, I'm glad you guys brought that up because I'm getting really sick and tired of the Doctor's obsession with Clara. Um, one thing is being friendly with your companion. One thing is, you know, having that loyalty. But this is coming across like a complete freaking obsession, almost as though a lover cannot lose its partner. Well, he was obsessed when he was Matt Smith with her as the impossible girl. So just because the obsession is over in that respect doesn't mean that an obsession goes away. I suppose, okay. Hey, but I don't like her. Oh, so I stop don't... being obsessed with her. Yeah. Oh. She doesn't want her to turn into him, and she is turning into him, which is really getting on my nerves. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, again, the, the clock is ticking out, although uh, 
I, I don't know. I uh, again, I, I consider this to be a plug and play episode because it really didn't really talk too much about the previous two part or season opener. It was just okay, bam, we're here, let's go. Now, did you notice that this show was one of those two people writers? It was Jamie Matheson and Stephen Moffat. And Jamie Matheson writes well on his own. He wrote Mummy on the Orient Express. He wrote Flatline, two of the best episodes from last season. He writes with Stephen Moffat, and we get this thing. Yeah. Mm. That also makes him the guy who so far has written two very seminal Capaldi lines. You know, it's just like, you know, I am the man that stops monsters. And I guess we could probably credit him with, you know, I'm the doctor and I save people. Yeah. But we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get that. We get to the third act. But uh, I don't know. I, I think he probably, he probably wrote the cool stuff and Moffat wrote, you know, stuff for his waifu, you know. Uh, <laughs> and um, that's probably how it worked out. Probably. Well, I will say this, that I had, I had a lot of hopes. I didn't see the guitar in this episode yeah, and yeah. the sunglasses were broken and i'm like ah see that's why you don't have wearable technology look how quickly he broke that that but wouldn't have happened to the screwdriver it was interesting because the sunglasses get broken and get ridden off at the beginning of the episode but the fact that the sunglasses are there and they're in advanced technology help the story along as well yes i mean, yes. I mean it's not like they just created Sonic sunglasses, and they're not doing anything with them. At least there are. there's a reason for it. There could be another reason, but, you know, there's a reason for it. It's not just being frivolously there. Or right. Is, you guys can contradict me on this. No, I... I, I, uh, I, I well, I, I think when it turned into sunglasses, I think they were definitely kind of trolling the old school fans. I, I literally... I think it was a very obvious hee-hee-hee, we'll get lots of clickbait, you know, anger hits on this when we give them sunglasses, but I mean, hasn't someone alluded that they did already sort of say that it's a temporary measure and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, they did say that it would be temporary and, and, and most likely for marketing reasons, they'll go back to the screwdriver. And hopefully it'll be a new design, uh, one that Capaldi can call his own, at least. That would be cool. Yes. Yeah. yes. And as a Doctor Who merchandise retailer, Mark, I'm sure you would have no problem with that. I would have no problem with that. Right now at the conventions coming up, I'm going to have to sell the old 12th Doctor signing screwdrivers. Will people still buy those? I don't know. Yes, they I, will. Yeah, they will. They will. They they will. will. They'll be new fans, but... Um, yeah, the whole okay. Uh, I I did like it when he rolled his dice. Oh, Vikings! Well, yeah, it's 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 like okay, he's gonna have to deal with a rather primitive and savagely violent uh, ones. But after watching a few episodes of the show Vikings, I thought these were rather tepid BBC Vikings. Yeah, they were, weren't they? Made a complete mockery of it. Um, I will tell you this: the the show Vikings itself would have had a nice pillage and plunder on that village and make a mockery of the Odin god. Oh no, no, no. <laughs> I, was, I was just kind of like, they, they could have just been Celts or something like to that effect. I don't yeah. Know. But, uh, yeah, I, I thought they were they were quite placid and, you know, the blacksmith guy and the baby and everything else. It was like, all right, I, I get it. Like, their warriors were sucked up by phony Odin, which is you know, uh, an alien impersonating a god is a very tried and true sci-fi trope. And mm. um, Star Trek used it many a time. Yeah, yeah, we we and, and this we we've, we've seen it kind of this way before. A little, little. I thought I thought there were little shades of face of evil actually in this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Face of evil. Very, very. It's a very distant tether, but it, I think it was there. Was I the only one annoyed with the constant crying baby? I mean, I I have kids on my own, and even I try to work my hardest to make it stop. Yeah, the, <laughs> the thing, I, I was watching it with my girlfriend, and and when the baby he started translating for the baby, she was like. All right, this is a stupid episode. I'm done. And, uh, no, I mean we're, we're having problems watching this. I, I, I mean we liked the last two episodes, but this episode, uh, and, and and it had so much promise because I mean Macy Williams was in it. Everyone loves Ariana Stark, don't they? Yeah, as Ariana Stark. But I mean now uh, I, I will say this: with all the hype, with the trailer and everything that we've been seeing, you know, like now the what took you so long, old man, makes sense. But I wasn't really expecting her to be the high. Hybrid. I'm not sure if I'm excited about that or not. Or if, if she is the hybrid or whatever. I don't know. That's another sticky wicket. Definitely this episode, once again, had a lot to say about, uh, oh, testosterone and warriors <laughs> beating their chest is bad. Meanwhile, yeah, Maisie and Clara are shaking their heads about, oh, those guys, you know, like, like waving their swords, you know, and as the doctor just rolls his eyes at anyone who answers that violence is, is the first reaction, yeah. even though the doctor's last reaction is one of violence, but you know, we, we, 
We won't carp into that. When the aliens called the warriors from the Vikings, you know, the strongest ones, and they brought them up to their spaceship, did you have, just looking at the spaceship, think to yourself, oh, a Vogon constructor ship? I thought that, and when I saw Odin's face in the sky, the first thing I thought of was, ah, yes, you know, yes, it was Monty Python. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, but I, I could just... see those aliens going, Resistance is futile. Resistance is futile. Kind, kind of, kind of. And and, 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 and the and, green liquid in the, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, mashing them up just for, for what? Uh, you know, like, oh, liquid testosterone. And this this is actually the first note that I wrote down, which is I'm getting really tired of meeting a brand new alien race that the doctor says they're one of the deadliest races in the galaxy. It's like, uh, look, there's got to be a finite amount of deadliest yes. races, okay? Well, get them back. They're going to come back they're not over well they spent a lot of money on those war suits so i imagine that they they would uh i thought those guys were robots i didn't know there were actually creatures in the inside yeah i didn't either i didn't either i liked yeah. how they looked kind of lamprey-ish and stuff like that yeah. at least they, they 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 have a unique and cool look so i appreciate that and i assume that odin looks like them yeah yeah it was a hologram the face was a hologram yeah. projection yeah we didn't see his true form which i thought was a little bit bad but the way he was like yelling and screaming will you will will be again it's like okay well we'll pop up again but these guys were okay villains for a throw off but uh, they weren't to me like a level threats of oh no. my goodness what happens when the, these guys come after the doctor i don't yeah i don't see it no these were the closest things i've seen to doctor who klingons yeah okay klingons yes. yeah kind of kind of kind of blustery and then and they uh, you're you're supposed to believe that they can kick ass but Really, it seems like they're not so good at it. No. Well, you know what? Speaking of the spaceship, what I, what I thought immediately when they had all the Viking warriors in there, it just reminded me of the Star Wars the trash room scene where the cl the walls are closing. Well, and, yeah. them, and they're like, oh, my God, no. Yeah, that, you know, and, and that's one of the things that I kind of, like, thought about. And, you know, I was like, oh, I wonder if the walls are going to start closing in on them. And there it goes. <laughs> there it goes. They get turned into testosterone alien sour mash. Oh, yeah. Yummy. Yummy. Yeah. yummy. Oh, it looked like sour apple uh, Jolly Rancher liquid. Protein shakes. Oh, no, no, no. I take Viking warrior testosterone. I, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm like... <laughs> and again, doc, doc, you can't hold... I, I get this. You can't hold Doctor Who up to hard sci-fi standards there's a no. lot of it there's a lot of it i think it makes sense but again i just sort of think it was like oh come on if you can invent a faster than light drive you can invent and synthesize liquid testosterone unless it was just something in their alien culture that it's like a badge of honor to go to some well, warlike they, they world were saying and suck that it out honor of. and all and the story is the thing yeah the 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 reputation they had was yeah. what was important, not reality. No, I thought the story was about knowing what a baby feels like. Well, you know, we do <laughs> know how to speak baby. But you know what? I thought he would have forgotten how to speak baby when he forgot how to speak the sign language and said, oh, it got dumped when he regenerated. I thought the baby talk would have been dumped too. I thought his translation. Was... Yeah, I was like, okay, I get it. I get it. It shows the doctor's compassionate side. We only needed one thing about it, though. And um, and again, twice in this episode, the doctor did not really come up with uh, the idea. You know, first no. of all, Clara had to once again slap him. You know, <laughs> it's like, well, you figure it out. You know, so again, she's really the protagonist of the story. And then the baby saying fire in the water, you know, like gets the doctor to fire in the water. Where the hell did they get the eels anyways? Like, who just has, uh, like, two Vikings buckets full had, of electric eels? No, 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 that, that made sense. That actually made sense for a historical... Uh... It did? Because I was a little curious about that. I, yeah, go, go back, <laughs> read about Vikings and the fishermen, and, and they have eels in that part of the world, and, and they probably, you know, they I guess they eat them or something. I don't know. I, I, uh, I'll, okay. I'll okay about it. I've, I've never, I've never heard of them hurting electric eels before, but, uh, well, I mean, I, I don't think, know if they hurt them, but the, I don't know. I, know the, <laughs> they, they, they were there and, it you know, was, again, and it's I, possible. Yeah, I mean, and certainly electric eels do not, they do not generate this cartoonish electric zaps that, you know, ever since <laughs> the Tom and Jerry days, electric eel. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, well, I mean you can look at like a nine volt battery and get a, a better shock than uh, uh yeah but well, again i get it is okay through timey wimey terminal knowledge he juices them up and i, I like that they cannibalize the, the space suit yeah, uh, yeah. For, for the, the fact that they had the cold opening gave them the space suit 
you know, the more I think about it, it was really kind of an A-team sort of a Doctor Who episode. Yeah, it was. And the only thing they didn't build was a car. They always yeah, built a true. car in the A-team. But I guess they built the dragon. Okay, so Maisie Williams in it, so you have to have a dragon. Uh... Is, that, is that the law? I, I, like think, I think that's where they came in with this, especially the fact that they tied her directly to the dragon and nobody else. I, I, just I wanna, like the character of a shoulder. I just want to know where uh, these Viking women are getting their eyebrows done because hers look <laughs> great. And I don't know where they're getting the threading done, but uh, give them give them my number and are they free on Thursdays? <laughs> And the subtle makeup, too. That was a good one. Well, everybody was realistically dirty, of course, except her. They gave her a clean face, and I got it. She was a, a, a speaking character, and they wanted her to stand out a little bit. But, yeah, I was already being all like, oh, no, this is, this is Mo- she's going to be Moffat's new pet, isn't she? And, and I think at the end, I think we pretty much established that, um, that the doctor broke his own rules to, uh, or broke the two rules of time and space to do it. Yeah. And again, not in a bad way. We can tackle that now. Uh, we, well, we, no, no, but- before we go there, before we go there, Let's go back to the A-team analogy. Okay. The training of the Vikings, or I mean, that, that was... really was A-team. That really yeah. was. It was a, it was a comedic segment. You know, uh, I'm. How do I say this? Was that stupid, or was it stupid when? After they get the real weapons, they cut to complete disaster <laughs> and fire. I Man. mean, it's funny, but it was stupid, and that's A-Team. That's A-team it didn't need right to be there. there. Yeah. It didn't need to be in there. And what I've been saying this entire season thus far is that there's a lot of things that being in the show that I find to be particularly cool and interesting and funny, quirky, whatever, if it wasn't on Doctor Who. Yeah. On any other show, it would have been fine, but it's kind of taken away from Doctor Who and it kind of feels like oh well let's spice things up let's make it more fun and exciting you know because we got a whole bunch of younger kids watching you know that's our audience blah 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 and it's <laughs> like no oh no there, I, I, I absolutely agree with you I, I feel like there is a lot of uh, they're pandering to what they perceive that the new audience would like and I don't think they're quite right on that yeah. you know oh, granted I call him the one guy ZZ Top I thought was kind of funny ZZ Top was cool I like Heidi Heidi yeah. because of the Braids, yes, the I braids. loved it. <laughs> I'm not sure why Lofty was called Lofty, except that that's a decent name. He looks like a Lofty. I mean, he looks I like know. a Lofty. Yeah, he's a Lofty. Yeah. So, you know, but yeah, was it hilarious? Yes. I was just kind of like, you know, just what the hell? It was it was A-Teams. It was the plot of the Three Amigos. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah, it was actually, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it totally was. was. Yeah, you have to have the quirky puns there, the guy that wants to go into battle but can't stand the sight of blood and faints. You know, of course, we have to have that yeah. stuff. No, we didn't. We didn't. We didn't. We didn't. We but, didn't have to have any of that. But that's not cool. only didn't you have to have that, but when Clara's explaining the disaster, the person she's talking to to explain what's going on is unconscious already. And she continues to tell the story. I yeah. think he had popped too a little bit. Like he had he was coming up and no, you know, no, I think he, he went down and then Lofty came up. And she continued talking as if Lofty had asked a question, but Lofty didn't ask the question. Huh. <laughs> she yeah. was just so talking there you go. She was just talking to us. <laughs> The viewer, I guess. Since when does she get to break the fourth wall? Uh, you know, I don't think that's fair. I think only the doctor should be allowed to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and actually, one other person can do it. Patty, remember Cave Savandrazani? Of course. Okay. The uh, the, the head, the executive. The that executive ran the, uh, yeah. completely broke the fourth wall the entire four episodes. I loved it. Yeah, I, I, I kind of thought that, you know, looking back on it now, I think the timeline works. I think that might have been like a, their own little cheeky uh, takeoff of uh, House of Cards. Yeah, which the, yeah, the British yeah. version of the time was in their time, and it was the same thing. And if anybody's seen the American version, you know, uh, yeah, there's little asides he does. Very, very Richard the Third ish, where he's talking oh, yeah. to the audience and yeah, like his, like a combination of inner monologue. But yeah, it's, it's, when it's done right, it's brilliant. Yeah. When it, yes. if, it's, if it's done haphazardly, oh, God, you just want to claw your eyes, eyes out. It comes out goofy and not very well put together. But then that leads us to the... Actually, Patty, I think you wanted to get into, you know, go ahead and, like, bust your knuckles on one particular topic here. Well, it's a couple of things. Well, first of all, I, you know, the whole baby talking translating is like, okay, it's, uh, okay, we get it. The Doctor is, like, so sensitive and such Whoa. a character... We only needed one baby translating scene, and okay, that's fine. You know, it's like if we're supposed to believe that he speaks dinosaur, then okay, I guess he speaks that. 
But um, yeah, I, I think I definitely though at the end, Moffat created a, a new special snowflake, and I and, and I don't know where this road is going. I don't know if she's if obviously she's in the next episode. Yeah, uh, let, let's 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 take a step back. So at the end, after they save the day, a shoulder's dead because the episode's called "The Girl Who Died." So she's dead. And the doctor is moaning. He's like, oh, I hate this. I hate losing people. I'm supposed to save them, but I can't I save like them because there are rules and I can't do this and I can't do that. I genuinely like that. I like the fact that the doctor says, no, I, I can only do so much and right. I've got to walk away. But the funny bit is, is that I thought the way he brought her back, I don't see how that violates any of the time laws. Well, it doesn't violate the time law, except that he brought back someone who was dead. Bringing I don't, back someone who's dead. I, I don't I don't think bringing somebody back from the dead is against the laws of time. I think preventing well, it, it, their death It changes deaths. the timeline because if she, well. But, let's, but it, does it though? Well, it does, and we will find that out next episode. Okay, you know, okay. I, I don't know. I in my, in my own in my own head, Ken, and I always looked at it as like, okay, you know, it's like, no, I can't go back and save Adric. Adric is dead. Okay, right. and there's no, I can't. There's no pieces of him left that I can try to assemble together. It just seemed like, okay, she's freshly dead. I'm going to insert this alien technology in her. It'll rebuild her DNA, and then. You know, Alakazam, boom, she's but back. But the reason why he stuck the alien technology in her head, that I thought was brilliant. They've been talking about it ever since Peter Capaldi was named the new doctor. Yes. Uh, there is a scene where, you know, he's he's ruminating why did she have to die. He sees his reflection, and he, then all of a sudden he sees Cassilius. He sees Cassilius. And he realizes Donna Noble is right. Why can't you just save one person? Why can't you just save somebody? And they show flashbacks to David Tennant and to Catherine Tate. And it, it's just, it's a great flashback. It is a great flashback. And, I, and, I, I am, and I'm glad that, first of all, I was totally against them having to acknowledge this. Because again, too, I, I feel like that is coddling the new fans. Yeah, yeah and it was. We, we, we never got an explanation for Commander Maxwell. No, no, and, we didn't. Uh, and I... And I, but the whole point is, we don't need one. That's what I always thought. Look, it's a sci-fi show. Go with it. And but, we were afraid that they were going to do a whole story or a whole re-acting uh, of a scene to do it and waste time. But instead, this flashback just made, and then the flashback to Deep Breath, where he's wondering why he chose this particular look. Yeah, made him realize, you know what? I am here to save people. I am here to see, and so he saves her. Mm -hmm. yes, saves he her because he can. Even in that, that but one curious thing that fires a Pompeii episode was that tennis doctor in that, like he he did it, but he was like so grudging about it because he knew he was like, look, I could this this could really screw things up. You know, I'm shooting the dice on this that this isn't going to screw things up, and, uh, and that's what like, he's doing again. Yeah, he is doing that again, and I, I think this time it is going to bite him in the ass. Well, if you watch the trailer at the end of the episode, it looks like she is really messing things up. I mean, she's not living a, you know, a, a nothing life. She's getting involved. She's looking for, what, what was it, the uh, Jewel of Hades or something, which, which they haven't explained yet, but is probably something vital to the history of Earth. Yeah, this is why we don't give children things like that, Yeah, actually. That's why you don't make a child immortal. Like, you don't do that. <laughs> right. And I and I, and I, do, I did appreciate him giving her the extra one, too, at some point, you know, in your awful immortal life that I've given you. You're going to... Wouldn't it have been nice if Duncan McCloud had one of those that he could have given to... No, because Duncan <laughs> McCloud's got to no, be give a it cool to Tessa, And guy. then we could have had Tessa not die in season two. And they could have been together for the rest of time until their heads were taken. Oh, you're talking about the Highlander show. I'm talking about Highlander. I didn't say Connor McLeod. I said Duncan McLeod. <laughs> McLeod. You should have known with McLeod. McLeod. That's, there are two McLeods. TV show. Connor That's McLeod is the movie. Duncan McLeod is the TV show. It's his cousin. Yeah, yeah. but there can only be one. There can only be one, right. Yeah, there is only one, the movie. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're not going to talk about how hey, I like Adrian Paul, okay? I, I... I like him, too. I just... Uh... Did you see we're him in sagging. that show, Tracker? No. My God. <laughs> Was I supposed to? No, you were. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you can watch it on Amazon Prime if you really want to. No, I, actually, it's on Hulu. It's on Hulu. You can now, I do remember him from uh, War of the Worlds, the TV series, which is absolutely... 
I still tell everybody that is the darkest, meanest, yes, like, 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 I don't know how, I don't know how they're, they pulled it off. I was like, this show is cruel. Yeah, like, it was, wasn't it? I oh, mean, here, here's your daughter's powdered brains. Here you go. Enjoy. <laughs> it's, it's like, you know, oh yeah, we use a graphic scene where we drill into her head and suck her out. It's like, yeah, I, I definitely understand how it didn't make it to season three because it just probably the second season was so even darker than the first one it, that it just you couldn't go anywhere without it's oh a, come on one whole season of that is one episode of game of thrones uh, no no d- d- eggy did you see the show it might be a little before your time yeah no i oh wix <laughs> world of world uh, yes i did uh because i didn't i refused to watch the movie because everybody kept talking about oh well the book oh the series you, you know and this well, and the i'm like i wanted to know actually takes place in the continuity of the tv series that's what i heard it's so a pre- I, yeah. You know, I decided just to watch it for a little bit, and I couldn't, I, I could, I didn't make it past season. Well, season, <laughs> season two is the distressing, dismal, dark thing you've ever seen. Yeah, it really, it really puts game. And it's the great. Game. And it's great. Adrian Paul was great on it. But anyway, doc, anyway, yeah, Doctor Who. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's okay. We have the same thing. Uh, monster sucking out testosterone of uh, big Viking men. Ew. Big, big strappy Viking men. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Oh, oh. That, I just don't know why. I mean, it could have been anybody. It didn't have to be Vikings. It could have been anything. They were not very Viking-ish. No, they were derpy. Derp. That's a good word for it. They were very it, it, derpy it, and goofy. It could have been just a simple case of, uh, you know, it, they asked the historical department. And it's like, uh, we need some historical costumes for this month. What have you got? And it's like, well, uh, all the Celtic stuff's rented out for uh, that other, that our Game of Thrones imitation show. Oh, how, how about Vikings? Like, oh, that works. There you go. That'll work. It's, like, it's either Vikings or pirates, you know? And we've already done pirates with Matt Smith, so we yeah. had to go with Vikings. And, you know, even the doctor was like, oh, Vikings. What the? I don't want Vikings. I'm not ready for Vikings now. And the yo-yo part. Yeah, I think Well, that. my question, I, I I wonder if they're trying to make him, like, more cool and hip just because he's older. Like, are we trying to make him more appealing? Like, they hey, are. don't, let's not lose the fans here because, you know, like, no, listen, if you look the story, it makes perfect sense why he's old now. Makes perfect sense, yeah. you know. So you don't need to spice it up. If you are a true fan, you follow it regardless. You don't need a freaking guitar and CZ Top references well, to know, continue the to watch this. Was his own idea. He he was in a punk band, Dream Boys. God, what a terrible. That's name. so cool. And now he's the doctor. Which and now he's the doctor. And he should move on. Exactly. I'm actually okay with him being fifty-ish and having sort of a rock background because yeah. that 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 that, that kind of. That kind of puts him in like a almost like a, a Mick Jagger esque sort of doctor sort of yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, how about that? It's like yeah, okay, I'm, sure I'm, enough. I, yeah, I, I'm actually I'm actually okay with his 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 rock and rollisms and stuff like that. Um, I just think that he should form a band before the end of the season and have Craig Ferguson show up in it as a drummer. Just to bring back, you have a Dream Boy reunion on Doctor Who. On Doctor Who, it's going to be called Doctor and the Clarinets. Oh no! No. <laughs> they do a cover of a Cliff Richard song. <laughs> yeah, no. Baby, come back as soon as Clara dies. That's what yes, they're no, no, no. <laughs> Let's do the predictions. Is the immortal Miss Stark? She's going to be in the next episode. Is she going to keep popping up, or is her arc going to end this season? Well, is she the new River Song? She's probably going to keep popping up. I, and you know what? The keep popping up may not be bad. I mean, except we wanted Jenny to keep popping up. And did she? Nope. Yeah, nope. And Jenny would have been better because I, I think that Georgia Moffat was a great doctor's daughter. And the character being the doctor's daughter, being like a kind of clonish kind of thing, I think would have made some good story points. This doesn't. This is just somebody who he, you know, kind of remembered, but then said, oh, it was a premonition, but backwards. You know, it's just somebody that now is immoral. There's- Which I kind of, I kind of liked, uh, I kind of liked the premonition. It was just, yeah, like, like to a time sensitive, it's just time playing backwards. I was like, oh, okay, I could, I could take that. I mean, it's a good explanation and it's a good theory, but I, I just don't see her as that special. And now she is special because of that alien device that's now inside her. And, uh, well, again, this, 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 I, I think this is slightly pandering to the wish fulfillment of the Tumblr girls, which is just all like, oh, gee, I would love for the doctor to come by and recognize that I'm special and I'm different from the people in my hometown and, you know. <laughs> oh, and gee. 
Mm. OMG. Okay, well, see, well, technically speaking, her premonition did come true when she is greeted by the warriors. And, oh, oh yeah, my God, yeah. I have this horrible yes. premonition that you all died. And, well, it wasn't in battle, so that little quirk was off. But they all died. You were right about that. Congratulations. Well, they had, High five. They had swords in their hands. They were in battle against the wall. So I'll, 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 I'll give them that pass to Valhalla. Yeah, Valhalla looks like it sucks, by the way. Okay. <laughs> it does yeah. suck. Valhalla. <laughs> <laughs> Quite literally, actually, sucks testosterone right out of you. Now, it's interesting. This is a two-parter, but it really isn't. But it's a two-parter because Maisie's in both. And the next episode, The Woman Who Lived, is written by Catherine Tregena. So we have a woman writing the next story. It's a different writer than the one we just had. So it doesn't really feel like a two-parter, does it? Why did they put To Be Continued? It, there was a pause. They had her, like, living through the ages. They were panning around her, going around her, showing the, the world changing around her. And then oh. it, it went to black. And five seconds later, To Be Continued. Yeah, that, 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 was the, really... that was the shot that, to me, was just like, what is the point of this? And then I was just like, oh, my God, I do know what the point of this is, and I don't like it. Yeah. Um, well, it's the Michael Bay effect. As you saw, the Roman candle blowing up explosion. That's very Michael Bay. Uh, the, <laughs> j- the spinning camera around the person. The only difference is there was no dialogue or other people standing in a circle because apparently that's how we all interact when we're speaking to one another. <laughs> but it, it, that's exactly what came to mind. I'm like, what is with this Michael Bay camera? Anytime that a camera spins around like that and all this stuff is going on, it just it almost just makes me sick. I'm like, oh my god, make it stop. You know, but I think that to be continued, what they were really going for is that all of a sudden, you know, you see her facial expression just slowly changing to where, like, almost this is hell for her, you know, and now she's she's upset. She's 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 so mad now. Like, it's it's almost like, OK, well, I'm about to start stirring up some things. I think the whole point is to essentially summon the doctor back to make so much noise that the doctor has no choice but to, you know, kind of see what the mayhem is, what's going on. And there she is. You know, with whatever and it, deal and bargaining. And it, and it seems like such a minor bit, too. I mean, all right, we've never heard of these Mayans before. So how is this? OK, I get it. This little bit of technology is going to make her live forever. It's like, OK, I, I don't I don't see the connection. It's not like this disc that he inserted her with was, oh, this is the Crystallis of Rassilon or whatever. You know, <laughs> it, it didn't seem important enough to make her important. And it right. looks like they really want to make her important. Yeah. Just because she's Maisie. Well, I, I hope that they actually do do something with that, uh, where, you know, perhaps this is the child version of something that's linked in the future, another character that we perhaps have seen before. But if, if she's stuck as a child, I can only imagine that that is the end of it. That would be, you know, I'm going to make some noise, pop up a couple times here and there throughout the season, and done and done. Well, let's hope. And I seriously mean that. Let's hope. Uh, I think that's about all the time we have for this review of The Girl Who Died. Do we have any last thoughts on it? Like the rest of the season so far, there's a lot of parts of a la carte that I really, really enjoy. But when I, again, when I put them all together, I look at it as a cohesive narrative, it doesn't gel for me. Yeah. It doesn't I, match. I have to agree. Mm-mm. The dress is a bit too tight. It looks nice, though. Well, we're going to take a break. When we come back... We're going to have Gigi Edgley, who played Chiana on Farscape, amongst other things. This is part of our Beyond the Hooniverse department here on Marku 42 here on Krypton Radio. We'll be right back. Attention all Whovians! While you're waiting for the new episode of Doctor Who, start your own adventures with a book from Marku 42 Books. They carry unique and rare books at affordable prices. Visit Amazon.com slash shops slash Marku42. That's Amazon.com slash shops slash Marku42. Marku42 Books. Set your imagination free into the Hooniverse. Now for a behind-the-scenes look at GeekCast Radio Network's newest show, Talking in Circles. So, Chuck, Greg, what are you guys thinking for this week's show? Well, Dan, how about we just talk about the things that we've read or watched this week? We do reviews like that every week, Chuck. How about a game like Fact or Fiction or The Power of Names? Those are great, and we're always coming up with new ideas for games. And how about some top fives? You know how I love my top fives. What about tournament-style brackets or sequel reboot and destroy? Who will win in a fight? Taking too far? Crazy but true news? Or Yes, it appears we have lots of things to work on. 
Listen to Talking in Circles, taking timeless topics in new directions. Every Tuesday on iTunes or GeekCastRadio.com, the GeekCast Radio Network. Hey, Dan, who's the guy with the creepy voice? Kid? Yes. Shut up. Beyond the Night is the GCRN's latest review podcast. We are covering everything in the Knight Rider television universe. From the classic 80s TV series to the 1991 reunion film, Team Knight Rider, ugh, and the 2008 relaunch series as well. So join TF2 and Mike and Dion the Music Man as they go in-depth and Beyond the Night only on GeekCast Radio Network. You can find Beyond the Night in iTunes and on www.geekcastradio.com. Yes, Michael. Just keep driving. Hi, this is Chase Masterson, and you're listening to Mark Who 42. How cool is that? Welcome back to Mark Who 42. This is Eduardo M. Fryer, and I am here with Christian Basil, and we are going beyond the Hooniverse with our very special guest, Gigi Edgley from Farscape. Hi, guys. How are you? Hello, Gigi. Thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute joy to be here. I really appreciate well, it. Thank you for being on. So, Christian, do you want to get things started off? I think you wanted the first question. Well, just in case maybe people haven't seen Farscape or any of your work, can you tell us a little bit about uh, yes. yourself to the to the audience out here? Yeah. So, um, my uh, many, many moons ago, I auditioned for one episode of Farscape and it's a Jim Henson show and it was on a top leading show on the sci-fi channel for some time and uh, it's an amazing show it's about an astronaut that gets sucked up into a wormhole and he actually gets captured he ends up on this ship and it's a living ship and uh, all the prisoners are pretty much trying to get home and my character comes on around episode 15 and she's the only one running away from home and everyone else is running to home and her name's Chiana and she's totally cool the makeup took three and a half hours every day for over five years and we usually worked about a 16 hour day five days a week uh so after the very first episode they delivered me a next script and I was like what's this about that this isn't for me it's I'm only in this episode and they're like oh you must be uh, in the next one too because your name's on it and I was like what <laughs> and that's how I for the, from episode 15 to 22 that's how I knew I was part of the show is they just kept randomly delivering scripts to the trailer door I'm like this is cool and then by season two I made the opening credits I'm like well I'm in now <laughs> <laughs> You don't know this, Gigi, but you're in the episode whether you like it or not. Yeah, exactly. You're in the whole uh, series now. Yeah, yeah. That's and nice I'm like, I just thought there must have been someone Someone didn't inform one of the writers that I was meant to only be in for one app. And I'm like, don't tell him. Just keep writing me in there. <laughs> <laughs> now, the series was on the Sci-Fi Channel from 99 to 03, and then it came back again as the yeah. piece was for so, uh, four years later. Tell us a little bit about the two dynamic series. This was the first time where I realized how, I mean, I always knew that, you know, the love and the adoration and the enthusiasm of the fans was massive, but originally it was meant to go for five seasons or more, and then they cut us short after season four. And after season uh. four, they literally said to us, you know, um, that show's over kind of thing. And, and I saw them destroy the ship and I, I saw them pack up the clothes and it was a done deal. And then I did a, a signing tour and all these amazing, they call themselves scape, scapers, uh, the, the Farscape fans, um, said, we're, we're going to bring it back and we love it so much. And I said, guys, I love it and I love you and I love your passion, but there's no way. I've seen the ship literally be ripped up and put in a dump truck. There's no way that this is – I wish it would, but there's no way it's happening. And they're like, we'll bring it back, we'll bring it back. And sure enough, <laughs> it was the pure – the pure love and and commitment of all the scapers and they bought it back and it came back in the form of a mini series and it's quite interesting because recently I moved to America to host the Jim Henson Creature Shop Challenge oh. and I was sitting on the side of set and Brian Henson came up and he goes guess what this is and he showed me like a yellow envelope with something in it and I was like what is that and he goes it's Farscape the movie and I went are you kidding me <laughs> and I tried I tried to tackle him to the ground give it to me <laughs> he said not not yet it's not done yet yeah exactly i said i better be in there 
<laughs> so I do know that there is a, a huge chance that, you know, um, Moya and the crew may live again, but, but we shall see. But this other show that they asked me to come and host was sensational. It was called the Jim Henson Creature Shop Challenge, and it was 10 creature designers that compete for $50,000 and a year to work full-time at the Jim Henson Creature Shop, and it was oh, really awesome. Too bad I don't have skills at making any of those types of things, or I would so be there. I know. I can't That's even make a, a sock puppet in a oh, week. <laughs> it's crazy. It's like I would read the challenges and just go, how on earth are they going to make these creatures? And it was literally like two-day challenges. These creatures that the designers made were absolutely phenomenal. It, they, they're not just um, puppets and muppets, and we all love and adore muppets and puppets, but it was actual creatures that they had to design, fabricate, build the animatronics, and then they had to create a story around them, and then they actually had to come in front of the judges and perform the creatures as well, so they had to, you know, get in there and, and puppeteer them and make them move it. So there was so many really clever and intriguing elements of the show. And one of the other cool things was that we've all, over the years, been influenced by the Jim Henson Company. You know, everyone that I speak to has been inspired or has learned from the stories that they have taught us as we've, you know, grown up through our childhood. So this is the very, very, very first opportunity where you actually got to see inside the creature shop and see what makes it tick and see these amazing constructions and stories come alive. So it was a real a real blessing to be involved with the with the production. Wow. It definitely sounds like that. Like I said, I've I've just I've adored Jim Henson since I was just very little. I've just been a huge fan of Jim Henson. So I mean, that sounds incredible. And also I just felt so grateful as well to know that I I still, you know, are in their minds and hearts because I I said to Brian Every time that I hear that there's a, you know, a Dark Crystal sequel or a Labyrinth sequel, or I'm like sending him 20 emails a day going, I want to be a fairy. I want to be a creature. I want to be a mermaid unicorn. He's oh, like, just stop yeah. bothering me. Go away. <laughs> well, they brought the actual Muppets back, so. Yeah, I mean, well, hey, yeah. yeah. Get them on the yeah. TV show there. And everyone I speak to is, you know, fascinated by all of those productions because they're such a big part of us. You know, even like you look at Kermit the Frog, it's, it's a bit of felt, sorry, Kermit, but with eyes that don't move. But still, we've laughed with him. We've cried with him. We've, you know, he's taught us secrets of the universe unknowingly. So it's how they have reached so many people and, and you know, inspired us through our lifetime is pretty pretty magical it's not easy being green now looking at your background it's not just jim henson and puppets you're proficient in ballet jazz singing martial arts and the one that really got my attention was fire twirling yeah so as as you uh as i've discovered on my intriguing journey is that you need to you know be well versed on every level <laughs> with every kind of trick that you can pull out of your hat so my upbringing my father was a, a promoter and one of the big things that he used to tour around was circuses so throughout my years growing up he used to bring out the Bolshoi Ballet and Barishnikov and Marcel Marceau and Nureyev and Kiss and Shakespearean productions so I don't think I ever had a choice being an actress or not it was just it was me it was well sown in my soul <laughs> and I think um, the fire twirling actually came about when I was living in Brisbane in university and we didn't have a TV and my friend came around he's like check this out and he brought around some fire poi and a fire staff and I was like oh my gosh this is amazing and it's a really beautiful meditative process as well like there's this the sound that they um the poi and the staff make when you're spinning them that actually almost transports you to a different universe it's quite beautiful and you've got to have a very good understanding of the craft as well because if you go in aggressively you'll burn yourself and if you go in and you're fearful of it you'll burn yourself <laughs> so it's it's you know it's it's a good lesson they've taught me a lot all the fire twirling and it's also quite fun at parties <laughs> It's a good conversation starter. <laughs> Imagine. Do you want to drink the hot flaming? <laughs> oh, I've not done that yet. Although I've all been tempted at many a many a late night. Maybe this is the night when people are like Gigi, no. <laughs> <laughs> Do not try this at home. You, know, yeah. you mentioned when you were talking about your upbringing and about every all the promoting your father did. You mentioned Marcel Marceau. That isn't just a random person. That's arguably the world's most famous mime. Did you actually get to meet him? Yes, there's actually a, a photo of um, somewhere. I, I think my mum has it, and um, 
I'm a little girl, I've got little pigtails and I've got the biggest scowl on my face because I remember meeting this guy. Of course, I didn't know who he was. I think I was like five or something. And he stunk. He just stunk. I think it was like vodka and sweat. (laughs) (laughs) And as a kid, you don't know who, you know, you're just like, that's a smelly man. And they wanted to do, they wanted him to hand the flower to the little girl and the little girl be like, oh my gosh, it's Marcel Marceau. And so the photo is him trying to be all Marcel Marceau. And I'm looking at him like, like totally freaking out because of this stinky (laughs) man next to me. And then from the other side, you can see someone like shoving a biscuit in my face to try and make me smile. (laughs) <laughs> I was like, do not ever work with children or animals. <laughs> Biscuits don't work. <laughs> so, yeah, it was pretty, pretty funny. But, um, yeah, as I've grown older, and it was cool, like my parents and my family are such an inspiration because that was old school showbiz. There was no Facebook. There was no Twitter. There was none of that nonsense. They had to do everything by telegrams, by newspapers, by, you know, I remember my mum, she was Princess Australia, and my dad said, get in the cage with the lion. And she's like, are you kidding? She's in a bikini with her Princess Australia sash on, you know, and she's sitting there with a lion, and you can see the lion's just, like, licking his lips. And strangely enough, sure enough, as soon as she got out, the lion tamer goes in there, and he, the lion attack a lion tamer. And mum's was literally in there with nothing in a bikini old school publicity tricks just be careful (laughs) so I think that's definitely influenced me as I've grown up to do the comic books to do the singing to do the events to do I street performed for two years you know I never I'd always try and keep my craft working one way or another and I'm very very passionate about music and as we're speaking before you know I've been recording some some music at the moment which has been great and the coolest thing that's happened to me one of the very cool things that's happened to me is it looks like Jim Henson's Creature Shop Challenge isn't going to get picked up and I was absolutely devastated because I moved my whole life my whole existence my dog my my cat everything to America and I didn't know what to do and then at Dragon Con actually I was approached by Runic Productions and they said would you be interested in doing this short film called Hashtag and it was like a amazing script I was like absolutely I just want to tell amazing stories it's the whole reason why I've traveled around the world I don't want to commit to stories that I'm not passionate about and that I you know, really, really hunt down scripts that have intriguing characters and that are complex and really test the boundaries. So I said, how are we going to make this? And they said, we're going to do a Kickstarter. And I was like, oh, that to me made me very nervous because I've never gone down that route before. And then as I went along the Kickstarter process, I went, this is absolutely sensational. People, fans, friends, families are joining forces to make amazing productions with each other and you get to keep your artistic integrity i love working for the big networks i still audition for the big stuff but in between that i want to be making and telling amazing stories so it's been an amazing amazing opportunity for me to to be involved in the crowdfunding process so our goal was forty thousand, and we made over forty four thousand. and that film's in post-production at the moment and it's a really beautiful comment on modern technology and where we're all heading with it and we want to take it to sun dance and Khan and Toronto etc etc and then recently I was approached by Carlos Aldana and he bought me Nexus and it too is a just absolutely intriguing story and it's about love and it's about courage and it's about believing in your dreams no matter what and then it's also about alternate realities there you guys say alternate Ooh. sorry i have to learn how to be american speak that, it's no, that, really that's, that, that still really cool. I, I don't, Chris, christian that still works i mean i don't know that uh, alternate yeah. reality yeah. Yeah. <laughs> i don't know how to speak american do you uh, american <laughs> well, speak. well see I'm, i i have a hispanic background so there are times even i can't say something american you know so america America. <laughs> Such yes. a big melting pot that no matter where you go, if you're from New York and you talk funny and, or yeah. down here in Florida and such like that. Floridian. Yeah, we talk Floridian. Well, even, well, there, there's even like, there's even Hispanic Floridian, American Floridian, Southern Floridian. So oh even goodness. then you don't have a. Alligator Floridian. Alligator. You know, <laughs> uh, um, yeah. Yes, so that... uh-huh. <laughs> yeah ang- angry driver Floridian. Uh, <laughs> Not that child child friendly, that. Uh, so someone told me that Florida was the, in comparison to the Australia of America. I'm like, how does that work? I don't know. Maybe because you guys have creatures down there that eat people. I Tons don't know. Tons of snakes. 
Tons <laughs> of snakes and spiders we haven't discovered. So the little project that I'm working on now is good old Nexus, and it's at Indiegogo, and we've shot some of it. We actually were filming it over, uh, we started last weekend, and it is so cool, and it's very stunt heavy. So they took us to the Cirque du Soleil school, and he's like, uh, okay, they brought in the, the stunt team, and they're like, all right, now we want you to jump on this trampoline, then we want you to backflip and then somersault, and then I'm like, hey, what? 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 <laughs> Nothing complicated. <laughs> Ah, so I did it, and I'm telling you, this morning for th- I did all these crazy stunts for three days straight. And this morning I woke up, and I tell you, I need a walker to get me around the house. I'm in definite pain. Um, crazy, crazy. But yeah, so if anyone, if you guys want to check it out, there's a link on my website, which is Gigi Edgley, just my name dot com, and there's links to my Facebook and my Twitter, and I constantly update it with conventions and signings that I go to, and the next latest production that we're working on, and music and everything. And there's a, a link there to the Indiegogo Nexus. I think you guys have it up, don't you? Have oh, you got the link there? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, we we yeah. got we we got it up. And for whatever reason, they can't find something as simple as ggedgley.com. <laughs> we, we will be putting up a link ourselves. We will. I appreciate it. We we will make sure that they can find your website, the Indiegogo. Oh, we we will make it sinfully easy. Make it for, so. For make it so. Out. Make it so. Yeah. Because. The other thing with the good old crowdfunding too, like I said before, is that what I found through working with the big studios and the big networks, you're always going to be telling someone's story, which is fantastic, but it's always going to be guided by their vision. So it's kind of really exciting because I know I do lots of conventions and, you know, get lots of feedback from the fans and everyone is so committed to being real about, you know, traveling through the uncharted territories and being truthful about the story that they're telling. And I think it's great because we can actually work together in telling this story and all share that same vision and it's not sacrificed at any point because we want to meet ratings or because we need to cast this big wig Hollywood star or because it's it's grassroots, you know, kind of joining forces together and making a beautiful creation. So it's, it's a very special process and it's an amazing team we're working with. I think you guys will really, really dig it. And I'd love to – it was funny. We were actually on set – and the director's like, oh, my gosh, someone just donated an extraordinary good chunk of cash. And I was like, oh, are you kidding me? Wow. So we, and we've, like, people were so overjoyed and so happy and we're, like, high-fiving and stuff. And the coolest thing is it was, like, a 900-something dollar donation. And the reward for that is to be part of the film. And I'm like, this is so cool. I'm going to meet this person one-on-one and he's going to be – playing a pivotal role in the film and I was like this is this Ooh. is like this is how cool modern technology is I know it's a bit of a double edged sword but it's also so cool when you can use it to connect with people all over the world and yeah and and be part of a production together and yeah the more that I go to the signings the I just adore them like for the last 15 years I've been doing them because you know I love meeting people that have helped me every step of the way and I wouldn't exist if it wasn't for you know the fans and the friends and the family so it's a really beautiful process to do these signings and and meet people on the journey and now it's really cool too because you know it's not just hardcore sci-fi which we love it's also the guys from Goonies the guys from Napoleon Dynamite then you've got like all these random cool shows as well that I see people in the green room and I'm fangirling out trying to keep my stuff together you know? <laughs> I've always been a fan of like obscure and rather B-list movies, and we have a Wizard World here in Reno. One of the guests at the 2015 convention is going to be Barry Boswick from Rocky Horror Picture Show. How cool! And from this, I don't even know if we could call it B-list, but C or D-list sci-fi movie called Megaforce. 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 And there's a part <laughs> there's a part of me that actually when I go to the convention wants to kind of bring that up to him. Totally. Oh, of course. Totally. Absolutely. That, that, and that's the cool thing is that you know pe- people it's every time I'm at a signing everyone is always so happy, so excited, the guests, the people that come to the show as well because you're meeting like childhood influences and people that have been your form of escapism, all our form of escapisms, and they've allowed us to believe in our dreams and and follow what we love in life as well. So it's a, it's a, it's ex- extremely special time when you can actually have that interaction with people and you realise that you know they're normal people and they live and they breathe and they have issues too and they have normal people problems as well and and I think that's really cool. Were you actually a fan of sci-fi before you took on Farscape? 
honestly, my favourite film was The Dark Crystal and The Labyrinth. I've been more in the world of the phantasmagorical, like Never Ending Story and The Storyteller and that kind of energy because I'm a big oh. fan of unicorns and mermaids and fairies and critters and creatures. Um, and then good old Farscape flung me deep into the uncharted territories and, and now I, I'm a, a big fan. I like kind of like the stuff like um, Matrix and that kind of stuff where it's not necessarily I, – I like the cool alien stuff as well, but I'm always intrigued by things that question our reality, you know, and bring it back to home, so – yeah. That's certainly a great list. The Storyteller. I loved uh, Dark Crystal and Labyrinth. Uh, Amazing. You know, what, Amazing. I still will catch myself singing uh, David Bowie's Babe song from, uh, yeah, from Labyrinth. You know, we all Who know do? It. You do. Remind me of the Babe. <laughs> Well, Gigi, we've loved talking to you. We know that you are presently about ready to work on some other projects. So we don't want to keep you that long, but we do want to say thank you for coming on. It was a joy having you, and good luck with the Indiegogo campaign. We can't wait I to really see what Nexus it. is about. Yeah, I think you guys will just love it. There's a really cool pitch online if you want to check it out. And I'm absolutely blessed and humble and so, so grateful and to be, you know, to have a chat with you guys and, and share a bit of love and light along the way. Thank you very much. That was a great interview. I'm, I'm, thank you once again, Gigi, for stopping by and letting us do that. And go and fund for that movie. Go go to her websites. We'll have them on the uh, webpage for you. Uh, if you're listening on Krypton Radio, go to markcrew42.net, and it'll be there. Christian, if he was here, which he's not, would be telling me to tell you about Time Lord Fest coming up this weekend, this Sunday in Tampa at the Event Factory. Sophie Aldred's going to be there. Yay. The person who played Mel's River Song in Let's Kill Hitler will be there. Uh, Robert Alsop will be there. Catherine Sullivan, uh, who is a writer and a big fitness writer. And Christian and myself will be there. Yeah, we're going to be there. Mark 42, we're going to have some panels. Be there. Mark 42 Books will be there, too, selling Doctor Who merchandise and rare books that you can't really find anywhere unless you go back through time, which this is a time travel program, so maybe you can. The following week, we've got Hurricane Who in Orlando, and Patty, you're going to be there with us as well, aren't you? Yes, I will. Uh, we run around Halloween weekend and uh, seeing what kind of uh, who mischief we can uh, get into there at our pals at Hurricane Who. And um, yeah, I may and also at, at night I may be also be sneaking away to Spooky Empire, which will be down the street. That's cool. That's cool. One is so opposite from the other. I don't, I don't see a conflict. And then we're working on MegaCon Fan Days uh, for November. We'll keep you up to date on that. Any final words from the Peanut Gallery? Peanut butter tastes good. It does? You should try it. I, I have tried it. It's good. Patty? Yeah. Well, this weekend, while uh, our cohorts will be at uh, Time Lord Fest, I will actually be down in Miami for Animate Miami. And uh, I'll be uh, doing some emceeing and hosting. And uh, I, there will be some Doctor Who events uh, down there, which I will be a part of. Oh, cool. So. Yeah, so if, you, if you're not able to go up north to Time Lord Fest or South Florida, then by all means, uh, stop by Animate Miami, brought to you by the people that do Magic City Comic Con and, of course, Florida Supercon. All right. Don't forget, folks, listen to our old episodes on iTunes at markwho42.net. Join the Hooniverse Army. Go to our Facebook page, markwho42, and tweet us at markwho42. There's a lot of markwho42s there. Google us at Mark Who 42 and you'll never run out of us. You're an egomaniac. Man. I am an egomaniac. I'm taking <laughs> drinks because I am self-promoting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Next week, because of the uh, conventions that we're doing, Patrick, myself, and Christian will not be on the show. So it will be Iggy with Ed and Trish. They will be reviewing The Woman Who Lived, plus... It is our special Halloween episode, so we've got an interview. Well, we've got two interviews for you that I think you'll enjoy. So it'll be a bumper Halloween episode next week. So until then, goodbye, everyone. So long, and allons-y. You. I don't need your help, Doctor. You got your dad as a sidekick. You need mine. Just this once, you can't run off like you usually do. What happened to you? You did, Doctor. Mark 
42 has been written and presented by Mark Baumgarten, Christian Basil, Eduardo M. Fryer, Patty Hawkins, and Iggy Matthews. This show was edited, produced, and directed by Mark Baumgarten. Please visit markroom42.net and register to join and be a part of the Universal Army. We can be contacted by email at mark at markroom42.net with the subject line question mark. If you have worked on Doctor Who or are working on a project relating to Doctor Who and want to be on our radio show, please email our media relations director, Christian Basil, at marku42media at yahoo.com. Doctor Who and its properties are owned by the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation. This show is owned and copyrighted by Mark Baumgarten, 2015. You're listening to Krypton Radio.